Park niggas know me. Curb on, little homie. All days, all days. Yeah. Been a road, been a road. Hey, my man, Big Stokey, man. Good my to man, have you coming, man. Man, my man, Chris, bro. You on this, uh, Thank change and jewels. Thank you for, for the invite, man. Yeah, I, I couldn't I know. miss it. I've been, yeah. duck, I've been unintentionally ducking this great interview, man. So, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, finally yeah. made it. Yeah, I, I know your schedule hectic, man. I know your schedule hectic. So, I'm, 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 I'm going to jump right into it, man. Um, uh, uh, Baltimore, man. I know you from, what's the, uh, White Lock. Right. And for the people that don't know about White Lock, we done seen her a lot about Baltimore. Give us a... A backdrop of White Lock, man, coming up in White Lock. Well, they, they call White Lock, White Lock City for a reason because it's like a community inside of a, a – it's a city inside of a community scene. Like, we have mm -hmm. everything we need around there as far as resources. So, mm -hmm. And it was very tight-knit, um, very level community. Everybody was hands-on. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't a whole lot of violence as I was coming up. Um, and we wasn't disenfranchised. Like, we was a part of everything that was going on in the city. Right. So if it was basketball, White Lock had somebody representing basketball. If it was right. track, they had somebody representing track. Yeah. And up until this day, we always had um, our hands involved and engaged in something that I can think, you know, was either positive or influential in the city. Okay, and that's, and that's a good word right there. So, and, and that's my next question. How would you say White Lock affects you positively and negatively? Um, well... You know, I, I made poor decisions on my own. You know, mm -hmm. White Lock, you know, as I know it, has always been influential in my life because it, it showed me how to be a man. And without those teachings and those lessons, I, I know I couldn't be who I am today. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are certain things in every neighborhood that's inescapable, right? Right. But you still got to make the choice. And I knew right from wrong, so I can't blame White Lock for that. Mm -hmm. White Lock introduced me to a lot of different lifestyles, but it also taught me how to survive. Mm -hmm. And I look at these kids now and how they're so domesticated. But to be honest, you know, if it wasn't for White Lock, I don't know where I would have got my survival tactics from. You know, I probably would have been making so many poor decisions, you know. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, I can't blame White Lock for that. So and it had its good and its bad, but more mm -hmm. than like, I mean, I mean, more than anything else, mm -hmm. it, it molded me into being the man I am today. So, right. you know, that's always good for me. Right. And, 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 and you said White Lock. Helped you make you know make some good decisions also. So what what White Lock today in 2022 missing <laughs> that the youth had that that you had that they don't got? Well, I mean right now you know um you know I, I don't want to say it's not a White Lock because you know due due to redlining you know and mm -hmm. a whole bunch of other political you know moves the city made White Lock has been re-domesticated so it's nowhere near like it was when I was coming up. I mean, right, right. It's a real community, right? Quiet. Yeah, gentrification right there? Gentrification is real okay. in Reservoir Hill. So, okay. um, and, and not even that, it's just a lot of other things that have changed in the city of Baltimore that has affected White Lock in terms of social economic and stuff mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not the same neighborhood as it was. It's a beautiful neighborhood now, but, you know, growing up, you know, you missed seeing you know, and I, I don't want to sound dysfunctional, but you miss seeing winos or people loyal yeah, yeah. in the corner, yeah. singing old, mm. old but goodies and all that stuff. Mm. We don't have that no more. So, right. but it's, right. it's a wonderful neighborhood to live in now. My part, my, my sister, she's still on a home around right there. So you know, okay. White Lock has paid its dividends. Okay, cool, cool. Man, what's the difference? Of, uh, people don't live in Baltimore. We always hear a lot about East Baltimore, West Baltimore. Give me the uh, distinctive difference between them, and also I want you to tap on because. Till I started dealing with Rock of Baltimore guys, I ain't even know the South Baltimore part of that. Just, so give me the difference between East and West and give me a little bit about I mean, the I South, mean, what, what? that's considered South, Cherry I mean, Hill joint. So, like, honestly, like, um, it's, it's all one and the same. You know, you, you got mm -hmm. different demographics and, and people, you know, they, they hustle different. You know, mm -hmm. East Baltimore was always, to me, a little slicker than West Baltimore. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. um, because, you know, we did a lot of things, you know, outside the houses in terms of hustling, they probably use houses. So I, I really can't say that distinct, you know, difference between East and West or mm -hmm. South Baltimore mm -hmm. because, you know, um, me growing up, I always had respect for East Baltimore as well as South Baltimore. So I, I really mm -hmm. couldn't say an East Baltimore guy was weaker than a West Baltimore guy right. or West Baltimore guy was stronger. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody who got money or everybody who got love and respect, it was always the same or on one accord. It wasn't like, oh, okay, just because you're from West Baltimore, you're not successful. Right. You got to be from East Baltimore, you know. Right. I mean, sports was very competitive, you know. Girls was always something that everyone would, like, go back and forth, whether it be East and West. But for the most part, you know, when it comes to stuff like that, you know, it, it pretty much stayed, you know, community-based. If you're from West Baltimore, now or ten times, you dealt with somebody from West Baltimore. Right. If you East, you dealt with somebody from East. And South Baltimore as well, you know. 
But um, it's all at one Baltimore, like even in the institutions, you know, Baltimore is tight. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? They mm -hmm. don't look at where you're from or right. out of town. Mm -hmm. They tight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I know because it's Cherry Hill. That's doing like an island. You know what I'm saying? I, when I go, they got they had the motherfucking water by the builders. Yeah, Parking was lunch me out. Yeah, Cherry Hill, you know, um, shout out to Keep, shout out to Dirt, a lot of other good guys from Cherry Hill. But um, mm. it, 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 to me, it was, you know, a project that was so close-knit as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, because it's like, mm -hmm. it is like an island. Every, everybody around there knew each other. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, you know, for the most part, respected each other. They helped each other up, you know. So, like any other projects in Baltimore, but Cherry Hill was, I, I guess... The way that it was located, you know, it, 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 it was kind of easy for everybody to know who each other was. Right, know? yeah. yeah kind of yeah, it remind me, it remind, actually remind me of Island. Like, it's like you got a, like a one-way in, one-way out one right. type joint, right? Right. right. So when, when you was coming up, um, I know you supposed to have, you had a brush with the law and all that. Would you mind speaking on your charge or you, have you ever been Which, which, which one? I mean, like, no, uh, I, I, nev I never been a, I never been um, uh, a, 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 Dick the criminal, like you know, right. I always evaded the police right. for the most part because I always thought I could think. Um, I, right. I had just to fight police a lot, you know. I right. like to assault police a lot. Right, right. And but one day, um, when I finally went to prison, it was for 15 years. You know, I got 15 years. You know, you did 12 with, with the feds. But I mean, it was for selling. Um, well, I pled guilty to a charge that they accused me of. You know, it was right. conspiracy to distribute cocaine and heroin. I don't never agree with the stipulations, but when you scared to lose your life, you just right. take the time you that you can live with, you know. So, um, I mean, again, some decisions I made was inescapable, mm -hmm. trying to take care of my family, not using the excuses, but it mm -hmm. looked like it was the best thing to do at that time. Right, it yeah. was fast, it right. was easy, and um, it was doable, you know. But now I wouldn't recommend it for no one because you lose more than your freedom. You lose your health, mm -hmm. you, know, you lose your family, you know. And more important, you lose time out your life that you can't get back. And to me, that's the most important thing that I could offer someone now is advice on how to maintain and restrain from losing your time. Mm, powerful right there, man. And speaking of assaulting the police, man, they told me, you know, I got my ear to the ground. They say you knife with your hands, man. I, I mean, I'm they, a little older now, say, man. They say no, you knife with your hands, man. So back then, back then, you know, before this whole consent decree and, you know, fighting police and police killing people, I mean, you know, it, it was a, um, an unwritten rule that if you ran from police, if they caught you, they was probably going to physically reprimand you. So you mm -hmm. already knew it's right. time to knuckle up because you're going to get beat up anyway, you know. Right. But it wasn't, for some reason back then, it wasn't personal. Right. You know, I don't think, to my knowledge, although you got, you know, um, discrimination and racism in mm -hmm. every department, mm -hmm. you know, that we can think of. But back then, it was almost like, you know, that was the rule. Right. You ran, you got right. caught, you're going to get beat up, you know right. what I'm saying? Yeah. Or then sometimes, if you deal with the wrong police, you say the wrong thing, he's going to put his hands on you. But mm -hmm. we felt like we was doing wrong, so that was almost justifiable. Mm -hmm. But I was like, you put your hands on me. I'm gonna put my hands on you, you know. Right, it didn't right. matter who you was, you know. Right. And so every police came around and they already knew that, you know, I was one of the individuals that was gonna fight back. You know, wasn't no beat me up, stomping me. No, we gonna fight. I'm gonna get locked up and I just see y'all in court, you know. Mm -hmm. And that was my mentality back then. Now it's different. They shoot you and they justify it later on, you know what I'm saying? So right. we didn't have too much of that back then. Or if they was doing it, you know, of course we had cell phones to record the behavior mm -hmm. and, and things like that. So people just were like, you know, hope hoping that it do be caught by a witness so somebody can see actually what took place mm -hmm. opposed to how nowadays, you know, we got cell phones so we can try to hopefully somebody record the incident with the police and then, you know, you, you got an alibi. But back then, right. you had to take, your, you know, your chances. Right, take your chance where I got you. Man, I, um, I seen you, uh, you got an interview, man. I see that, uh, and uh, sorry to say, they say you lost your mom uh, right. Right through age, right? right? And, mm -hmm. um, and you guys had information why you was incarcerated. I mean, no, no, no. She well, lo you lost it while she was in yeah, well, incarcerated. Actually, um, in 92, she had wrote me a letter um, explaining to me that she had contracted the disease, HIV. And, um, you know, I, I didn't believe it because at the time I'm looking for the disease, you know, mm -hmm. in her description, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But her mannerism was always on point because she never lied to me. She was always on point and transparent about anything that she faced, even when she was dealt that deadly blow. But I never read the letter till like several months later. When I read the letter, I was on the corner hustling. And I took the letter with me. I read the letter. And I went down to ask her what she taught me. She said she went to the doctor. They told her that, you know, yes, you HIV positive, you know. But, you know, she didn't pass away till seven years later when I was incarcerated, you know what I'm saying? And I called home one day to check on her. And prior to me um, talking to her, I called a girlfriend of mine who said that, you know, you probably won't call your mom. You know, and I called the hospital and... She was very weak and lethargic, couldn't hardly talk, you know, and her last words to me was like, you know, never give up, you know, because she knew I was fighting my, 
you know, my case and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. I mean, my mother was a strong woman. Matter of fact, her and my grandmother was probably two of the strongest people I ever met in my life. You know, so mm -hmm. um, she did everything she could do. But unfortunately, man, at that time, the medicine that we had today wasn't as strong as it was to save lives back then. You know, right, so. Right. But I mean, she, you know, she taught me so much because of her choosing to use drugs, I never did. You know, mm -hmm. I never smoked. Drank or did any type of drugs because of what I seen her go through, mm -hmm. and you locked up, and, and that, that's a hell of a blow, man. How did it affect your bit? I mean, honestly, it kind of motivated me because, like you know, like you know, a lot of guys who been in prison, you, know, you can't cry in prison. You can't go to the, you know, to the gym or weight room and start crying because you know, right. either you weak or lethargic, you know, or just mm -hmm. soft, and no one mm -hmm. wants to be seen or, or treated, you know, as a softy in prison. Mm -hmm. So, um, I started writing books. I started doing. A lot of positive things to help me, you know, you know, stay focused because I knew mm -hmm. for a fact she would want me to be, you know, a man mm -hmm. and dealing with that situation. But it was tough because you know you didn't get one mom. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? And my father never was in my life, so having my mom was all I needed at times. You know, and then when mm -hmm. she wasn't hit, when she wasn't there, I just did it myself. But for her to be gone forever was a tough blow, especially not being able to go to the funeral and say you know my final goodbyes. But I mean, everything happened for a reason. I think you know losing her really changed my life in so many different ways because now I make her proud and use her absence, you know, as motivation to do things I know I probably wouldn't normally do if she was here, mm -hmm. but it makes me want to continue to make her proud. So I do everything I can do not to ever, ever give up and, and never use the word trial to do my best, mm -hmm. you know, and that I live with the results. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, and, that, and that statement she said, never give up, so I know that's a... That's a mantra. Yeah. You can't even. Yeah, yeah, I start a publishing company behind that, you know, and yeah. it, it is a mantra that I live by every single right. day. And I mean, sometimes it'd be difficult because you miss your mom, you know, right. birthdays or holidays, et cetera, which, you know, I don't really right. commemorate yeah. or celebrate too much, but I just miss her being in my life because I got kids who I right. know she would enjoy being, you know, right, around yeah. and help me raise and, and, and also help me make, you know, decisions when it comes to relationships and stuff like that, you know. So, right. but like yeah. I said, you get one mom, you know, and, and growing up in the out, out community, you know, Mom was everything, you know what right, I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. But I tell you, I tell you, I know that jail joint. They gonna want to keep his his perception and go hard. But that would that would have been a day they gave you a pass for that joint. They crime with their mother. You, you no, know, I, that, mean, that, that I mean, I mean. But see, one. the thing about it is, you know, it wasn't the fact that you can't go in your cell and cry. I'm saying right. you can't continue to mourn in right. prison because everybody got problems. Right. You know, everybody right. going to do the same thing. You know, everybody in there fighting for their life or their freedom, and mm -hmm. you know, and the last thing they want to do is carry your burden. So mm -hmm. I mean, you you still human though. I mean, I was mm -hmm. able to you know. To you know, vent and, and deal with it in a in way where though it was manageable, but mm -hmm. it, it was nothing that I could allow to consume me while I did my time because right. you know I never would have came home. I'd have ran my bit up. Right. And speaking of time, how much time did you actually do? Like twelve years. Twelve years yeah. in. Straight. Yeah, at fifteen. Yeah, yeah, at fifteen. Years, yeah, twelve years straight. You were fair, you don't get no time right. off. Uh, okay. You know what I'm saying? Unless you. Okay. Until, what's you, the name? What about um? Uh, you you go on there, you, you, you brought your hand skills in there. I mean, you you young back then. You get any shots? No, nah, you, you know what? Though, it's so crazy, man. I was so I was so focused on, um, cause like it was so many things that was going on on the outside that affected my bit. Mm -hmm. I had to stay focused, and I ran to what I call self treatment. My self treatment mm -hmm. was writing, studying, going mm -hmm. to college. You know, mm -hmm. working on my mind, my body, and my soul, and then trying to, I mean, do my best to invest my time and things I know I could use when I came home, you know, mm -hmm. critical thinking skills, trying to be a better father, you know, a better friend, you know, a better, a better son, mm -hmm. a better person. So I wasn't going to allow prison to be the reason why, you know, I changed. I wanted the mistakes I made to be the reason because mm -hmm. prison is a building, you know, and I learned from my mistakes, you know. And a lot of people, they come home and, you know, they increase the recidivism because they think they're going to get caught up a different way they try to do it, something mm -hmm. different, you know. Mm -hmm. But I, I wrote books. I went to college for psychology, you know. I mean, I did a lot of things while I was in there, you know. I played sports, you know. Mm -hmm. I worked out, you know. And I just knew I, I, worked, I studied law. I knew that I was going to come home, you know, mm -hmm. and I wanted to be the best me when I got out of here. Right. And, and so when you went in, Constable, you, you went in with a high school diploma or GED? Yeah, I had all, all that. that. I, had, I had all that already. Oh, okay. Yeah. I already had, you know, a high school diploma and all that. So, I mean, um, I, I studied... I went to college before I went to prison, you know what I'm saying, mm -hmm. um, for real estate, business management, stuff like that. But then psychology was something I really wanted to study because, you know, I love studying people's behavior, you know, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and I realized that, that was something that was, like, would interest me. So mm -hmm. I went to school for a a Ashworth University in Atlanta, took corresponding courses, and honestly, I could get my degree in psychology right now, but, you know, take a few more courses, but... I just was too busy trying to play catch up, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I realized that I wasn't going to be a psychologist, so 
I didn't really want to focus on spending time on that when I know right now I need to make a living and do what I could do now to take care of myself and my family. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what year you got locked up in? What year was that? 98. Okay, 98. Okay, okay. Yeah, so, so, when you, so when you was locked up, they, uh, uh, you met the guy, um, Jay-Z man, Emery. Uh, how, how did that relationship, how did that develop? Was, it, well, no, we, well, we both, Emery was, Emery was facing the fair time too, uh, fair charges. And um, we, uh, you know, regardless of making mistakes, you know, I was, you know, had a, um, a very good, healthy relationship mm -hmm. with the CEOs over there. I didn't want no sallies, you know. Mm -hmm. I was fighting a big case and, you know, they, they had a lot of empty cells on the tier that I felt as though people could go in without coming with me, you right. know. So for months I had no sally. Mm -hmm. And when they got so crowded, they said, man, you know, we, we got to get you a sally. And I, you know, I looked at Henry, you know, and, and he looked at me, you know. And right. at the time I could identify that I was dealing with a man mm -hmm. without even knowing what, you know, his case or anything about him, you know, and he said he was from Eastern Shore. Like, damn, man, I ain't know they broke the law down Eastern Shore, you know. Right, right. But he was very humble. Right. Um, and he had this somber approach, so I had my clothes and commissary at the top bunk. Mm -hmm. And I, I removed everything and put it in the sink and let him go up there. He took his glasses off, put in the sink, you know. Mm -hmm. And I knew everybody over the jail, so when the, you know, the grill would break, I would grab the phone, call up town, and he wanted to get the phone check on his mom and uh, his kids as well, so I would go get the phone for him. But he wasn't in the sports like I was, you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? But he really was in the bidding mode, and he had, you know, some sweatsuits that from Rockaway, and they had sent them over. And I was like, "Damn, you don't want to wear that?" Like, "Nah, man, I ain't got time for that. I ain't going to visit," you know. Right. And and I, honestly, it was, Emery was the reason why I looked at taking 15 years as a walk in the park because mm -hmm. he told me that he was going to do it. And at that time, I never did any time before. Mm -hmm. And 15 years to me was a life yeah. sentence. I'm like, "Yo, that's a lot of time," you know. Mm -hmm. And you start trying to calculate because you no know, feds don't give you years; they give you months. Right. You know what I'm saying? You just gotta. Right. Try to add it all up. But, I mean, he was right, right, you know, rational about what he was dealing with. You know, um, he made conscious decisions even at doing then about what, what he was facing. So it made it easy for me to say, you know what, if he can take 15 years, I can take it. Hmm. Okay, yeah, so as soon as y'all met, he just – We just locked quick. right in, man, right. you know, and, you know, we stayed in contact, you know, throughout our incarceration. I would send a letter to him. Hmm. You know, he would send one back, you know. And, you know, like I say, you know, Henry has always been there for me, man. Like, when I when I, he came home – you know, his Cody from the which is another good guy, mm -hmm. reached out to me and told me that Envy was home. I reached out to Envy, and, you know, we've been locked in every since, man. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That was in 2010, you know. Mm -hmm. It is 2022, man. We've both been doing a lot of positive things, some some things we've done together, you know. But he's definitely a, a great influence in my life, you know, because he introduced me to guys like Jay or Jay mm -hmm. Brown, and they're some good guys in general, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and, and if not role models, you know, I kind of think as I look up, too, because they was cohesive and they was, you know, loyal, you know, to a cause that all don't believe that, you know. Out the park, niggas know me. Curb on, little homie. All days, all days. Yeah. Been a road, been a road.